Welcome, everybody. Today, we are talking to Jeffrey Schlissel, and I want to tell you a little bit about how we got connected. Um, we're connected on LinkedIn, and the thing that really caught my eye about Jeffrey was two words, bacon cartel. Anything with the word bacon in it instantly gets my attention. So one thing led to another. I've been following Jeffrey on LinkedIn and on his podcast, which we will talk about in a little bit. But um, welcome, Jeffrey. Is there anything else you want people to know about you as we start? Uh, I guess no. I think they'll they'll find out a lot, you know, as we talk. <laughs> yes, they will. So I was trying to figure out how in the world to really begin this conversation because there are a lot of parts and pieces to what you do and to you. Mm -hmm. So as I got to thinking about it, I was like, the one common thread I see is that you bring your whole self to every part of your business. There's nothing you won't talk about. Uh, you talk about the industry, you talk about your business, um, you talk about family. So I I'm all in too. I think that's what happens to people who are listening to you is you really get all in on your perspectives on things. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start mm -hmm. with the bacon cartel and tell me what is happening for you on the business front. So the funny thing is I worked for a major conglomerate for about eight and a half, almost nine years. And it was working with them. I was absolutely, I was actually able to see what bacon really is. And, you know, people are like, well, how could you be making bacon great again? Because bacon's always been great. Yeah. They're, they're the ha bacon. Yeah blanket statement it's always great unless you don't eat bacon obviously the problem is is that you see these defects and the manufacturers go from the extreme of the care from the animal the artisanal kind of way that we used to do things to now it's this broad commodity um, and now with a foreign entity eating up swift and smithfield i kind of in 2017 looked around and said this is not what I want. I don't want nitrites. I don't want to have, you know, the def defects that actually hamper the ability of the flavor profile. And I said, well, what can I do? So I started venturing and, you know, being the chef that I am and being like uh, a little twisted. And uh, I've been called the mad scientist by one of my regulars at one of the restaurants I was at. I wanted to push the envelope of what I could do. And I wanted to see how I could do things differently. And that's how the cartel got started. Then it morphed into this, um, passionate love affair with uh, everything smoke, everything barbecue. And it's funny that we're doing this because I did not plan this at all, but it says I would smoke that. <laughs> and it literally has a chicken, a pig, and a cow on it. Um, <laughs> but it's it's that, for me as a chef, it's that primal undertaking of treating that, you know, giving props to Mother Nature and the farmer who raised this particular item, whatever it's going to be that I'm going to put on the smoker. And I want to make sure I showcase that as the star. That's number one. Because a lot of times when you eat barbecue in specific and you're in Austin, so you have my mentor, which is Aaron, Aaron Franklin, uh, uh, Franklin Barbecue. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's some guys that do barbecue, some people that do barbecue. For me, it's overbearing, it's overpowering. And then you like for three days, you're, you're belching that, that smoke up and I, mm -hmm. I don't I never really liked it I loved it when I was eating it but I just didn't like the after effect so again what can I do differently how can I do things differently and that morphed into like doing rubs and uh, playing with different woods between cherry wood and pecan and if I had a source I would do orange wood but as we know in Florida Orange grows are far and few between, and they're a commodity because everybody still likes to drink their orange juice or whatever. <laughs> so I can't use orange. They are native to us in, in where I am now in Tampa. There's um, cypress, there's oak, and there is one other one I can't think of that I can get regularly. So that kind of ends my game up being more sustainable and locally sourced. All right. Which is another facet. Yeah. And and so I forgot to mention that if, in fact, you are head of the bacon cartel, that makes you the kingpin, which is on exactly. your email. So I had to mention yep. that. <laughs> yeah. When I first rolled it out, I wanted to do things with a little, a little risque. And so a lot of the rubs I came up with, I put, instead of saying Mexican hot chocolate, I put Acapulco gold. Well, that's a weed strand. 
And some of the guests were like, well, why do you call it that? I'm like, never mind, because <laughs> I had to dumb things down because it didn't make sense to some. Others, when you said certain things like Ichikuru or you Colombian gold, they're like, oh, I got it. <laughs> and I, funny thing, I was working at a farmer's market in West Palm Beach in Swank and a cop came up and I had these little dime bags with my label on it. And he goes, well, what are these? I'm like, it's a dime bag. He's like, what? <laughs> my kids it's a, it's a rub <laughs> he's he's like i want all of them <laughs> so he bought them and he was going to give them out to his friends and and that's what you know i think as the entrepreneurial side is how do you differentiate yourself how do you get that niche to be different from everyone else and i uh, for 40 years i've been cooking recently through the podcast i met um Fothergill, uh, Anthony Fothergill, he's the chef over at the Double Tree at the gate of Universal Studios. And we were interviewing him and he goes, yeah, I do Floribian cuisine. I'm like, really? I'm like, what's your definition of Floribian cuisine? So he says his definition. I said, well, mine's a little bit more, a little bit tweaked. But he was literally the first person other than Alan Susser, Mark Minatello and Norman Van Aken. That's the original mango trio who's really put the light on or spotlight on South Florida cuisine, which is the Floridian cuisine. Um, where, you know, you can say anywhere, like Austin, I could say barbecue and people are like, okay, Franklin, like we, you shook yeah. your head right when I said you had yeah. my mentor. Um, you can say cheesesteak and people go, what city is that for? Philly. And they know yeah. it's Philly, yeah. right? You know, New York style, well, pizza, you know, you know, thick crust pizza, Detroit, or, you know, the Chicago pizza. Florida doesn't have a, a cuisine that's known for. Key lime is not. Key lime is a French it's a pie. It's a custard. Anything you look at, you can dive down. Florida really isn't known for a particular, um, well, maybe a group of Reuben, but it's still, it's a, it's a twist on a Jewish delicatessen. Yeah. So there's really nothing that Florida stands out to being its cuisine. It's the immigration, the influx of immigrants to Florida that given us the wonderful cuisine we have to play with today. And uh, thank God I was there at that time period. Um, developing my culinary skills going through that whole stage. Awesome, awesome observation. And so now you are focusing on sort of that custom artisanal smoked meat. Are you do, you're doing that for clients now? So of the housing market here in Tampa, uh, the business market is actually booming as well, and it has been the hardest thing to find a brick and mortar um, shop that I um, want to do. What what I'm looking for is to do a butcher shop that features artisanal charcuterie with local uh, farmed animals. I literally have farmers 15 to 20 minutes away from me, uh, all the way two and a half hours south of me, which is uh, Circle C, which is Nicole Cruz, who's a phenomenal farmer. Um, so for me, I want I want to do that because, again, it's going to help our local community. It's going to help the farmers because I'm a farmer advocate as well. And then I also want to do part of the, the shop is going to be vegan uh, butchery, which is unheard of. There are some places around the country that do butchery that's vegan. Uh, for me, it's something that I can then push my envelope is thinking really outside the box with my plant-based cuisine. Um, and that's what really kind of drove me to plant-based. So I kind of do both sides of the gambit and, you know, people are like, well, I'm a vegan. I'm like, don't come into my shop. They're like, why? I'm like, because I'll be butchering whole animals. And they're like, oh, it's my my thought process with having the the vegan side of things is like, if you were a vegan and your husband or your partner or your girlfriend, boyfriend, it's a, a way for someone to have a one-stop shop because none of the big boys, and I'm talking like the supermarkets and all that, don't do that. Right. Um, the other side of it will be called BC Butchery, uh, Butcher Shop and Market. The market will feature locally sourced products with local businesses. So I have a local coffee shop that roasts their own beans here in Safner called Java World. And I want to utilize them. And then I found a great guy who imports olives from Greece, but presses his olive oil in St. Pete. So I'll be utilizing him. So there are other facets that I'll be growing with different revenue streams. And then the last revenue stream I'm going to be doing, which is really what I'm, I'm amped up about is, so I'm only going to be open from nine to six, but twice a month, I'm going to have chef dinners and they're going to be like over the top, 
I've got friends from the West Coast of Florida or East Coast of Florida, all the way to the Northeast, all over the country that I'll fly in. They'll stay at the Kingpin Casa de Schlissel and uh, <laughs> we'll, th we'll throw down some really good courses and, and have some really good time with some fabulous food and, and have that, that niche that nobody has. So I, I, call, it. I call it the, thanks. I call it like Sir La Tab or William Sonoma meets Butcher. All right. I can't wait to see how that progresses. Yeah. Well, listen, neither can I because I need to do something because it's killing me. <laughs> and you're, I assume this is the kind of thing that you would want to talk about on your podcast. So tell me more about your podcast. So um, when I moved, uh, a, a friend of mine, Coco Frey, who works in the industry as well, she actually is working for a um, manufacturer of plant-based called Corn, Q-U-O-R-N. She introduced me to Carla Finadini, who is the host of the Walk and Talk, and it's a media um, consultant group. And we have a magazine. We have a um, Dirty Dash, which is a, a for the bartenders to make drinks, and we showcase that restaurant. And then we have the chefs do their dinner, and we do some recipes, four to six recipes, and we feature them as well on the podcast. On the podcast side of things, we take very trending topics and it doesn't no no hat no nothing's off the table i mean we're just going to go for it uh i think our latest one my buddy called me we did a podcast with about the the bacon cartel and everything about it and we switched gears and went into the nra situation with the national restaurant association where they were using funds for 25 million dollars worth of profit to suppress the wages of minimum wages of the hourly workers without our knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so my buddy called me, he's like, dude, we were just talking about that and here you're your podcast and you were talking about it again. Dude, I, I'm, I told him, I said, I'm not gonna stop talking about it. Um, I guess it's one of the things about me we were mentioning when we were in the green room. Um, I, I, I think we need voices. I think uh, it's paramount. We, we lost one of the greatest voices we ever did. Uh, and one of the greatest storytellers in the culinary tradition in twenty uh, in twenty eighteen with a uh, chef Bourdain. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm I'm anything like him. I, I, I there will be no one ever to replace him in our lifetime, or maybe ever. But I feel that what he did for the culinary scene in modern times is what Julia Childs did for me as a child. Mm -hmm. It was her and Jacques Pepin and. The Galloping Gourmet and uh, as Grand Cure, so I was trying to try a blank. Grand Cure, you know, those were the those were the people I watched as a kid. I didn't watch cartoons as much. Yeah. I was one of those nerdy, dorked out, geeked out kids that I love to eat and you know, and and I love to cook. And that kind of gave me some other issues as well as you know the food addiction as well. So there's so many facets. Yeah, and that's one thing I think I've loved about talking to you is just knowing that there is nothing that's off limits. I mean, I've heard you talk about the issues with the National Restaurant Association. I've heard you talk about mental health concerns, um, food addictions. So when I think about, again, back to bringing your whole self to something, maybe talk about how you're able to wrap everything that you are and all these interests that you have into one package and be able to talk about it and get it out there it, you know it's it's tough because um because you, you seem to be all over the place and it's tough to keep your focus and what i do is i i pick a topic that is on trend and i figure how can i talk about this in a way that i'm not going to set somebody off i don't want to have an argument and a lot of times there have been times where i posted on TikTok, and, it, and prime example we had a little bit of a family spat and it was just me and it was just words coming over it. And somebody goes, well, get over it. It's your birthday. And I instantly put out and shut that person down by saying, listen, I talk about mental health because I need to make sure that that one person, knowing that one person, if I can reach one person to save their life, then I've done my due diligence for that day. And every day I wake up in the morning, I think the same way I feel when I was 18 and I tried to complete suicide, I had nobody to turn to. Uh, and I was fortunate enough when I tried that or I did my attempt, I said something to my parents and I got help. And for two years, I talked about it and I stopped. 
uh, it wasn't until Bourdain's death and I watched a friend of mine, LJ Klink, uh, who's a fantastic chef and an unbelievable chef, break down and admit to total strangers at that point because we didn't know who he was. And he said, you know, I was going to try to complete suicide. And I remember standing up in that auditorium in the Amer uh, the National Convention for the American Culinary Federation. And I said, this is what we need to do. We need to shine the light on the pink elephant. We need to talk about this. We need to have three ships with our you know, our staffs. Because listen, we're the, the top five in drug addiction, or we are the top in the drug addiction as far as careers go. We are the, you know, alcohol abuse. We seem to have, you know, everybody that has an issue is drawn into the restaurant industry, whether it be somebody getting on the military who has PTSD, somebody who has um, all these different addictions or OCD, we seem to have that light of beacon come this way. We, we will wrap our arms around you. And it is a family unit. And it is something that we all can talk about and we can all, but we don't talk about those things that are need to be. We yeah. kind of push them under the rug. And I've had way too many uh, family members, way too many friends that have passed away from taking their own life. I think every time you post something like that, you're, you're touching people who need to hear it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. One of the biggest things I started with my book, which is about um, not only recipes, but about my food addiction. And I was talking to a therapist and I, I have a therapist as well. And we're working through my problems as far as my OCD and ADHD about food. But one of the things that really shocked me was when I was researching the food addiction, the therapist told me, listen, I'm battling, this is this therapist talking, I'm battling all of that billion dollar industry that wants to put you on a diet, not to fix you, because it's mentally that needs to be fixed, not your waist or what you're putting in your mouth. Because as soon yeah. as you get off that diet and start eating again, you're back on it. She goes, it was food, food addictions, which not necessarily overeating and binging. We have to also think about anorexia and bulimia. Yep. And people don't realize as far as mental health goes, it's the number one crisis in the United States for mental health that kill people. More so than the suicide, bipolar and all the other stuff. And that to me, because I'm getting ready to do a presentation in March for Cater Source, you know, 132 people in the United States take their life every single day. Mm -hmm. Every single day, you know, in the 26 seconds, somewhere in the world, someone's attempting suicide right now. 26.2 wow. seconds. And these are like huge statistics to realize. But when you talk to a therapist and they say the number one after, well, I should say before fentanyl, it was the number one killer, but this is the number one killer in the United States is the food addiction. And that to me was polarizing, you know, someone that has a food addiction and then trying to get the help I need. And now I need to talk about that. Yeah. Who else can I help? Yes, absolutely. You know? And we talked a little bit about your book and um, sort of those elements of of that journey, the sort of the memoir of, of how you dealt with food addiction, as well as the food itself and sort of building a better relationship with food. Um, you have any takeaways yet? Anything you would tell people kind of dealing with the same thing? Put your fork down. I think, especially if you're in the industry, especially if you're a chef, you know, today, for instance, I'm getting ready for the Super Bowl. I'm having some friends over and I, I, I don't know how to go small. That's another problem with me. <laughs> so I'm doing all these things, but I'm also getting ready to do like meal prep as well for, for me. Yeah. And that's another thing too. And I'm just going, 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 going. And I looked at the clock and it's like three o'clock. My daughter's like, oh, can you come pick me up? I'm kind of I'm like, okay, run over to get her. And I'm like, I sat down. I'm like, oh, I didn't eat today. That's not good. So your metabolism slows down. It's very important that we need to eat. The second thing is when you're eating, we, I usually stand up and shovel in and we have a saying in the industry and, and anybody that's going to listen to this, you know, eat it now, taste it later. And, and those are things we need to stop because what we're doing in the industry is we're causing these issues We're we're amplifying the issues. So yeah. if you sit down at the table, have a meal, like a normal person, eat, um, my daughter and my wife you sit there and go, all right, let's keep, let's chew 15 times. Well, I, I'm, I'm not that dude. 
what I'll do is I realize as I'm going, I'm like, oop, and I'll put my plate down my fork and I'll push it to the side and I'll take a, my drink and I'll sip. And then, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. Are you done? Nope. Just taking a breath. And realizing that that was the first thing that helped. The second thing that helped is telling that fat kid inside me to shut up mm-hmm. that he was no longer in charge. I, I wanted to take that power away from that kid. And I, you and I are pretty much the same age and growing up as a kid, you know, it was always that, especially when you had, I'm sorry, my dog's playing, <laughs> especially when you had grandparents that were from the great depression, it was always, you better finish your food. And, you know, my mom was always, there's starving kids in Ethiopia, you need to finish. And at eight years old, I was a smart ass. And I said to her, I don't think the kids want to eat this, you know, or let them come over and eat. Yeah. I, you know, you know, part of the problem is the environment we grow up in, but at the same token, and I've always said this, my mom always said to me, I'll treat my child like my father treated me and his father did to him so on and so forth. And at nine, I realized, Hey mom, uh, wrong because Jeffrey Dahmer and uh, Ted Bundy and Christopher Wilder and all these other mass murderers didn't learn from their parents. They learned from themselves. So we have an obligation that we can cut this insanity that's going around. And I have on my refrigerator, the quote from Einstein about insanity, doing the same thing and expecting a different turnout. Mm -hmm. And I also have a picture of my daughter. So that's my why. Awesome. And the other thing I think what was really helpful, I was reading one of my books about uh, binging and the guy was a psychiatrist and he said, put it this way. And what if I were to tell you uh, a, a madman said to you that if you ever eat like this again, you'll lose the person you love. If you put that in perspective, you'll never want to eat and overindulge because, you know, and that's my why. My why is my kid. So I'm, you know, every time that door opens and I go to, no, uh, it's, I'm done. I don't want to do this. You know, it's tricking your mindset and flipping it to doing something that's totally different that you should be doing. And I think this is the last thing I'll probably say about this one. I think it's the way the restaurant industry does things. For instance, McDonald's, you know, super size, um, you know, small, medium, large, uh, the big gulp from, you know, uh, the ridiculous, like 128 ounce, you know, bottle that you get from 7-Eleven. I think we need to stop this because we we have an obligation to our our guests as chefs that we should give the right portion of what needs to be done. And we need to make it wholesome. We need to make it good. We need and we can change the mindset of what's going on in the United States now. And that's just my thought my thought process. I like it. And as a consumer, I would enjoy going and sitting down and having a a satisfying meal that is not uh, that I'm not taking two thirds of it home and hoping I can eat it before it goes bad. And and because I feel guilty about the waste there too. So I I don't want to waste food. So I would be perfectly happy to pay the same price, honestly, and just get the correct amount of food. Right. And that's the thing. Correct amount of food. Let's take a break from the entrepreneurial piece for a second and go, Sure. what do you just love to eat? What's your, what's your favorite dish to make? What do people really want to want you to cook for them? You know, we're on a podcast and, and Jason Schofield asked the same question. He's like, what three dishes are you known for? Or you love. And I, I got to go to that um, one. I, I, by chance, I was 16 years old. I was making a filet and risotto and my parents were making a condolence call and I had a baked brie or sauteed brie with encrusted with almonds and herbs and I was, had blueberry reduction and I was so proud and I was like, oh, we'll serve this and I'll do this. And and they got home late and I was like, oh, I'm just going to slop this crap together and just put it on the plate. And just, there we went. And my dad was like, that is good, bar none, the best thing I've ever had until he, until his death. Um, wow. In 2017, it was barn on his favorite. Um, I have to admit that um, I have to say my bacon. I do a bourbon infused bacon jerk sandwich, a BLT, but we called it the jerk. And uh, we added red onion, slivered very thin red onion, 
on it with the romaine and it had the crisp. We had beautiful, like, like fresh tomatoes. And then we had ahi verde on it. And the ahi verde was a Peruvian um, sauce that just has so much complexity to it. And then the jerk comes in with the spice. It was just outrageous. We served it on a brioche uh, bread and it was stellar. And I still to this day, it's one of my favorites. Um, and I think the last thing is you got to go. Um, I just love doing things different, but I got to go with my plant based. I love some of the certain things I do with my plant based. Um, one of my my greatest accomplishments was getting into a fight at my old restaurant because we made a salad ni soie. It was 100% plant based. And the guest was complaining that it was real tuna, it was a real egg. And let me tell you, it was seared watermelon that was smoked. It was a tofu egg white with a potato and neutral uh, nutritional yeast center. And then we used black, black Himalayan salt, which had a very high concentrated of sulfur dioxide, which is the egg smell. And that's why we got into the fight uh, or I got into the disagreement <laughs> with the uh, individual. Um, but yeah, I, I have to say the plant based is for me. I love that because it pushes me to be different and it pushes me to be uh, creative. How did the fight turn out? How did, did they finally? We just got something or... else from them. Yeah, we, we got <laughs> something else from them. I wasn't going to, I just sat there and laughed hysterically. I'm like, because it just tastes too much like egg. And then we would do beet tartare, not beef tartare, beet, yeah. and we would smoke the beets. And our meatitarians, I don't like the word flexitarian, our meatitarians would, you know, be like, um, I don't eat beets. I'm like, good, let me just, let me get you a little taste and bring it out. And they would taste it and like, how did you get beets to taste like meat? Um, I'm like, just magic, you know, and that, that to me is where it really shines on what we can do as chefs. Like when we can get somebody who doesn't eat something and they sit there and shovel it in without even taking a breath, which is not good to do as we know, but it, it's one of those things that you sit back and you go like, I got them, you know, that that's the perfect the sense for me. That's, yeah. that's everything for me. Okay, awesome. So that leads me right into if you could sort of issue a challenge to the listeners and say, if you could only do this, try this in the kitchen, or just one little challenge to do something differently, or try something outside their comfort zone, what kind of challenge would you issue for them? Flavor. 100%. Don't be afraid of flavor. And I, I have to take a little page from Keith Saracen, another great friend of mine who is for 16 years just headfirst in the Indian cuisine and subcontinent of the Indian cuisine. I mean, he's even learned Hindi. That's how like deep dive he's going. I think people are afraid of the unknown and I think not to fear it. And the best way to get over that fear, there's some great books out there. Flavor Matrix is another one that it teaches you the science of why this particular item and this particular item will mash or don't even do it. Don't, it's going to be horrible. Um, and that's, you know, I use those as a, a Bible for me. I'm like, I'll think of something. And it's funny because people are saying to me, well, how come you don't even taste anything? I don't even see like I was working down in Sebring and the sous chef at the time, Madeline, she the chef there. She's like, I, I never saw you taste anything. How did you know it was good? I'm like, well, I taste the different parts up until the final product. And it's something, and I always I said this to my wife, I, you know, we have a steak here, let's say a ribeye, because everyone loves a ribeye, and it's going to be mid-rare. Well, what what accompaniments would really kick up this steak uh, a couple notches? Well, kimchi is in one, all right? Or in watermelon and tomato, that would be a great thing. Well, what about tom tomato, kimchi, watermelon? And then it could be, uh, let's go to uh, double stuffed baked potato or you know, lionese potatoes, or maybe do something totally different. Let's say celery puree or cauliflower puree. And then you start putting these things together. And that's how my mind works. It just starts thinking, okay, this should go well, this should go well, this should go well. And then boom. And I can't taste a steak before it goes out. Nobody can. I mean, right. you, you're going to get a steak and it's a little cut there. You're going to be like, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Well, that's a chef's cut. <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't happen. But I think if you're at home, I think challenge yourself to think outside, look at things. I mean, you go to the, the school of YouTube, you know, there's a ton of stuff there that you can kind of look at, or you can Google something and you don't be afraid. A recipe is only something to be 
creative. It can get, get your creative juices flowing. It's not set in stone unless it's baking, which is a whole other entity, which <laughs> right now I have for the next two days, I have pita that's fermenting. Uh, we're doing fresh pitas. All so, right. Yeah. All right. That'll well, be different. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. I love it. Um, so first of all, show me your tat. The, yeah. yeah. It's my bacon cheeseburger. Love it. <laughs> so I, I did that one time I had the pig. And if you notice, my pig is always down. And they said, no, no, bacon goes on top. I go, no, bacon's magical. It goes anywhere it wants. <laughs> Amazing. For me, I'm like, I don't work a day in my life. It's a hobby for me. Awesome. What a great way to, great way to spend time in the kitchen. <laughs> Sometimes it's not. <laughs> Today, today's been one of those days. I really didn't want to be in the kitchen. <laughs> but I've been in the kitchen since nine o'clock this, this uh, morning. All right. So tell everybody how to get in touch with you podcast is walk and talk you can get it on spotify or any of the podcasts and we actually have a youtube channel that we're actually distributing so when we could do the podcast it's similar to this but we're actually live in a hotel or a restaurant while we're doing it so then we then go back and you'll see the videos of what we're doing and um christoph one of the chefs locally here in st pete we did one where's bourbon and bacon and you will see us putting, well, this guy puts the bacon, literally strip of bacon in his bourbon. And, and Carl the host goes, what are you doing? I'm like, making it magical. <laughs> it sounds perfect to me. Okay. I think and that it, should be the challenge. Have a bacon, right. with, have bourbon with bacon. <laughs> right. Make it old fashioned, throw a piece of cooked, cooked bacon, cooked bacon, and enjoy <laughs> yourself because it's, it's absolutely mesmerizing to do that. Baconcartel.com. Uh, bacon underscore cartel on Instagram, uh, Chef Jeffrey Schlissel on TikTok. That is more of my mental health journey. And the food porn is definitely on the Instagram. And then we're on Facebook too. So that's the Bacon Cartel and Twitter. Awesome. Well, you are you should be easy to find. So, I'm... Sort of, kind of, yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. And we will talk soon. Definitely my pleasure. Have a great day. You too.